All right, go with me to Revelation 19. Tonight we're going to speak about the birth of Alleluia. Yes. All right? And then we'll go. Now you heard this last night, but we're going to go. We're not going to give them as much depth as we did last night. Okay? Because I want to give you something new. We've we, we got to get moving. And so we're, we're going to... Last night's on, on the website, so that if they want to go deeper, they, it's there. What was last night? We, we have Bible others. study. What? I talked to others. You talk to others. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's a mini series on heaven. Not not heaven here. <laughs> She's a series all by herself. Yeah. If, if anybody wants a series but, on heaven, yeah. what 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 what's it gonna look like, what you're gonna have bodies, what, what you're gonna do. I, I just done another series on heaven. Okay? Uh, it's Father Bill's movie, Heaven is for Real. Uh, Praise God. <laughs> and, and what I try to do is, I try to, in the series, get rid of all your myths. You, how many know when you, when you do funerals, like over here, that's all they do is funerals over there? <laughs> is, uh, people really die in this area. I'm getting out of here. Sort of thing. It's a lot all over the place. And by the way, uh, three people die every second, by the way, just for your information. I think they all wow. die here every second. <laughs> It's amazing because she's a drug. All right. So um, I'm doing a series on heaven, you know, like, oh, when you, how many ever heard this? When you die, you become angels. No, you don't. <laughs> I, I mean, I okay. So. It, it, it's the um, regular Bible study at Our Lady of Fatima, but it's online. You know, it's so on, if you want to go, if you want to do another Bible study, yeah. free, free, free. Um, so it's called uh, tonight What's or up tomorrow. Do it, do it, do it. Do What's a, up? Get a notebook and enjoy. It's all about heaven. What? What? That's all about. All right, we're in chapter nineteen. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you tonight the birth of the word Alleluia. Okay, where it comes from, why, why you say it, and how many know Alleluia is not an earth word; it's only a heaven word. You, it's only for heaven. More about that in a moment. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you for uh, heaven. And we thank you for this book of Revelation. And as uh, we get into the uh, victory of Christ, and we, we, we know his victory through the cross and the resurrection, and we want to go to heaven and live with him forever. So bless this, this gathering of the faithful, Lord. Help us to know Jesus as living Lord and Savior and fill us with the power of your might and majesty. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, now, heaven. Chapter 19. I, I just want to say, how many ever heard the word Hallelujah? You ever heard hallelujah? Yes. Now that sounds like Pentecostal or Protestant. Did you ever hear hallelujah? Yes. How many ever heard of hallelujah? Yes. Now Catholics say hallelujah. Across the street they say hallelujah. <laughs> What's the difference? The difference is one is Hebrew and the other is Greek. And that's the only difference. Okay. So uh, when I really get preached, I go hallelujah. I'm just going into Hebrew, okay? Now here, for the first time in the New Testament, we have the word Alleluia, or Hallelujah. Okay? Now in Hebrew, it means, here's the word praise. Praise. And here's the word, um, see the J-A-H? Those are the first two letters of this. Which you're not allowed to pronounce. <coughs> so praise. Praise the Lord. Now, when you all go to heaven, are you all going? Yes. yes. Did you send in your RSVP? Yes. To a living faith relationship with Jesus Christ? Yes. Now when you go to heaven, guess what will happen to everybody here? You'll get to say the rest of the word. Because nobody knows how to pronounce it. So we have praise, praise Lord. This is the name that we can't say. So we have a substitute name called Adon. Adonai. Now this is the word for my Lord. 
So Adonai. So we say praise the Lord, but what's the real meaning? It would be, but we can't do what? We can't pronounce this. Now, why do we have to wait all the way through our Bible, from Matthew all the way to the very end of the page of the Bible, we never hear the word Alleluia? Why were we silenced during Lent? Now, I'm sure you heard before it means praise, praise the Lord. But it means something more significant. Heaven says it. Earth doesn't say it. When you go to heaven, everybody planning to go? Yes. You're getting a brand new body. How many need a brand new body right about now? All right, three of you, okay. When you get your brand new bodies, as soon as you enter into heaven, what's the first word they're going to say to you? Hallelujah. It means, it means that you won the triumph. It means you won the victory. It means everything in your life has been conquered. And we have some things to conquer. Some goals to still meet. Some things that you want to grow in the Holy Spirit. Anybody have a few of them yet? Mm -hmm. I do. You know what my, one of my main purposes of the rest of my life is? If God could use me to bring one more person to Jesus Christ, that's the purpose of the rest of my life. See, I start small and I'm going to get it by God's grace. Okay? I, I want you in the kingdom of God. I want everybody in this church in the kingdom of God. So what does hallelujah mean? It's mentioned four times. It's mentioned four times. And this is the only place in the New Testament it's mentioned. Now, in the Bible, it's mentioned in a very strange place. Uh, I was with my friend, Father Mitch Papua. <laughs> Father Mitch and I have, uh, have many dinner and a, you know, lunch together. And he corrects me when I preach. I love, I love that guy. <laughs> One day I was preaching in, in Fargo. And, uh, and I said, and the hallelujahs begin in Revelation chapter 19 for the first time. I remember preaching. And he says to me, as soon as I'm done, he said, Father Bill, I said, yes. It's Psalm 111. I said, I know that. But I meant to say the first time in the New Testament. I didn't tell him New Testament. So he's correcting me with his big boots on and everything else. <laughs> and now I found out, I should email him. It's Psalm 104, verse 35. <laughs> so I should email Father Mitch. It's 104, verse 5. So if you go back to Psalm 104, verse 5, it's the first time the word Alleluia appears in the Bible. Now look, look at that. I just want to show you that to you. Go back with me to Psalm 104. By the way, you're the only ones on your block that know this. And I, I, I want you to be aware because, don't we say Alleluia every day now? Yep. Yes. I love the word. In fact, if I ever became Pope, you know what my name would be? Alleluia the first. <laughs> I already got my name, okay? Is that great? So, if the Holy Spirit has plans. I don't think it's going to happen, um, but if it does, that's that's my name. Okay? So, if everybody goes now, now, now watch this, go to Psalm 104. This is just an introduction, and then uh, we, we won't go into deep as we did last night, uh, because I want to keep moving here. Psalm, so, you'll get new information tonight. Psalm 104. Now, go to verse 35. Everybody look at Psalm. Now, uh, j just to put a little note on Psalm 104, this is the Psalm of the Holy Spirit. This is the psalm of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to hear about the Holy Spirit, please read Psalm 104. Now go all the way to verse 35. Put a little star there. This is the first time Alleluia appears in the Bible. Let sinners be consumed from the earth. Now, so what is Hallelujah about? Sinners aren't sinning. How many know when you go to heaven, you're going to be 100% under the Holy Spirit? How many know you're not going to wake up at night with an urge for a pizza? How many know your eyes are going to be in the head and you're not going to look at the women? How many know your heart and your mind will be controlled by 100% by the Holy Spirit? Isn't that good? Yeah. So, that's hallelujah! How many would like to wake up never again to sin? That's hallelujah! How many would like to have a house no more? And sometimes they say it's happening in Mexico. How many would like to have a house where there's no mortal sin? Hallelujah! How many would like to have no flat screen TVs and people looking at it at 3 o'clock? That would be hallelujah. So what does hallelujah mean? It means the victory is won in your life that nothing will dominate you. And look what it says there. Let the sinners be consumed from the earth. Let the wicked be no more. How many would like to have a time where there's no more wickedness? Hallelujah. That's hallelujah. I, I think I'm probably one of the only people that are upset when they changed the, the blue laws. I love the idea that all the stores were closed. 
I remember Ocean Grove many times. I stayed overnight that town. I love that we had to get our cars out, even though it was a pain in the neck for my mother. Where are we going to park? Well, I mean, we, we got to drive to Asbury Park and park over there. Remember those days? And now they even broke down right? and, and, and everything else. Let's sit and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. How many of you can bless God? Everybody blessing God? <laughs> there. Praise the Lord. Can I say that in Hebrew? Hallelujah. Amen. Now take that verse. That's what the word hallelujah means. Sinners are no more. Wickedness is gone. Hallelujah. hallelujah. So where, what's the first word in heaven, everybody? Hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, that's going to change your thinking. That's what you're going to say for the rest of your life. That's what it means. So when the church does that on Resurrection Sunday, can you understand what we're doing? Does that blow your mind? When you say hallelujah for the rest of your life, how many know you say, there's no more wickedness? Because Jesus destroyed what? Sin. Sin. The death, the grave, the power of heaven. So let's go through that. After this I heard, verse 1, seemed to be a mighty voice of a great multitude in heaven. Now everybody underline that and write their angels. The angels are saying this. Now remember, I, I think I share with this group, is angels don't sin. Does everybody know that? Yes. Is that my boggling? My, my favorite song at Christmas it still is Hark the Herald. I'll, I'll give you a Christmas concert right now. Our angels sing glory. When you read the entire New Testament, it says they proclaim. Who sings? We do. Now no, notice what it says there, for verse number one. A great, how do you say great in Greek? Mega. So a great multitude crying, crying, hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power to our God. Now, what do they <coughs> say? The fullness of salvation has arrived. Now, I believe all of you are saved. I believe you're great Catholics here and you're filled with the Spirit of God. But how many know you're not fully saved yet? Because you, did you ever get up recently and just go, oh, the pain. Uh, emotionally, uh, physically, spiritually, the pain. So we're not fully redeemed yet, right? We can't say hallelujah in that context because we're still struggling. Until you say hallelujah, it's over. That's what hallelujah means. There are, when you say hallelujah, there's no more struggles. So when we say on Resurrection Sunday, there's no more struggles for Jesus. So when we say hallelujah, what are we saying? He's one. And we hope to follow in that same pattern. So notice here, what did the angels say? Salvation. Now, salvation in Greek is sotaria. The word soteria means, it means good health. Now, you've been told growing up that Jesus does miracles, and you believe that. But you never believed that that could happen for me. What, how do you believe? Grin and bear it, right? How many, how many had grin and bear it theology growing up? Or here's your favorite word, offer it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How many have Offer It Up theology? Anybody have that one? <laughs> now there is truth to offering it up. Colossians chapter 1 verse 24. But also to what we forgot to do is ask God to heal us. Ask God to heal us. This Friday I'm going to be praying over you to get healed so you don't look like this for the rest of your life. <laughs> Amen. I want you healed. I want you to have quality days ahead. How many want quality days ahead? Anybody want some really great quality days ahead? And... And if, if Jesus doesn't heal you, I'm going to still be, we're going to bear with it to one another. Amen? So Amen. maybe that's your supper. So we have salvation, soteria, which mean, in Greek it means, it means good health. Okay? Secondly, he says, he says, glory, doxa. That's where we get the word, what? Doxology. The glory of God. Doxa. What does doxology mean? Through him, with him, in him. How many ever heard those words before? Yes. That's doxology. When you say glory, God be through me. It sounds like St. Patrick's blessed breastplate. God be through me. God be in me. Through him, with him. Amen. That's doxa. doxa. Amen. You got it? I got it. Next, the third one is power. The, th the word for power is dunamis. And I told you when Wanamaker, John Wanamaker invented dynamite, guess what he did? He chose a Greek word. That's what, doesn't it look like dynamite? It means the power. The, it means an explosion. So when you say hallelujah, you say, I'm healed, period. I'm not getting sick anymore, period. It's done. What, what do you say? Through him, with him, in him, period. It's done. What do you say? Power is released. It's up, upon me. That's hallelujah. You got that? Yeah. Now, I want you to kind of box in a word there. Belong. It doesn't exist in Greek. 
How many have the word belong there? Yeah. The translators added that. I'm like, I, I want a Bible that just tells me what it says, all right? But we probably, we, we, we lay people couldn't figure it out. Nothing. Salvation, glory, and it, what it says is to God. To our God. To our God. It doesn't say belong. So if you kind of put that a little box in there, okay? It doesn't, in the Greek, it doesn't belong. Okay, do you, can you see the meaning? To help us understand, we put the word belong. To our God. So, why do we say hallelujah? We're, we're, we're totally saved. What do we say hallelujah? I got totally praised. Totally praising him. Why am I saved? I got told how. Hallelujah! You got it? Got it. Isn't this good stuff? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Holy Spirit influence you to understand what hallelujah means for the rest of your life. Now, he goes on to say, why else do I say, his judgments are true and just. I mean, right now we're not seeing the justice of God, are we? Do you want to see it? Then there's no mercy. Ah. You're going to get mercy. James chapter 2, verse 12 says, his mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy Sunday yesterday. So how many here would like to see the ju judgment? is coming. It's coming. And then you, the Lord is like, Miss Pat, yes, front and center. <laughs> Your whole life goes like this. You're like, that's what I did? Anybody want more time? More time. Why do you say you want more time? i got to change. i got to get with the Holy Spirit program. Because that's going to happen for each of us. And on that moment, you're on your own. I can't help you. I'm already in heaven waiting for you to come in, you know? Yeah. Oh, Lord willing, we'll all go to heaven <laughs> through a living faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we all make it, what do you get? What's the first word you're going to hear when you go to heaven? Hallelujah. hallelujah. You got this now. Why do we say hallelujah? Great. We say hallelujah because his judgments are really coming. Mm -hmm. Next. He, he judged the great harlot. Now, who's the great harlot? The great harlot is man's system. It was called, in Revelation 18, we did last week, it's man's system. It's called Babylon. How many know everything is going to fall apart? How many know the banking system is going to fall apart? Now, one thing I like to say about hallelujah here is because people will no longer be materialistic. Hallelujah! As Pope Francis is trying to tell us, to really share with people. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah! So, and when you read chapter 18, it's all materialism. It's gone. What happened when Sandy hit? I was walking in Union Beach, crying with a man. And he says, and he's crying, and I'm hugging him, and we're praying together. And we literally prayed outside. And he says, it's all gone. And today when the swath of tornadoes are hitting Arkansas, the people are, are, are crying. And 25 million people are under right now an unbelievable mm -hmm. a tornado watch right now. Mm -hmm. And they're crying. And we cried here, and we're still crying. But his judgments are coming, and the great heart, we're going to lose everything. Why, why hallelujah? Because we will not be concerned about materialism anymore. Isn't that hallelujah? Mm -hmm. What's the most important two things to us? Our God, our Catholic faith, and what's the second most important thing? Our families. And when you have your Catholic faith and that consoles us and you go home and your kids aren't there and they're not in God, you, you just want to cry. I didn't raise them like this. So what's going to happen? Why do we say hallelujah? There is no more materialism. And the great harlot, man's system, is going bankrupt. Have you noticed that? But yet, man's system is we're trying to capitalize off of one another. In your misery, I can make myself rich. And that still goes on. <laughs> Corrupted by earth with her fornication. How do you say fornication in Greek? Porneia. You've heard that word before, right? Yes. And he was avenged on the blood of his servants. Who are the servants? <laughs> the servants are the prophets. These are the men and women who try to tell you, turn to God. Turn to God. Turn back to God. And by the way, those servants in the United States in the church are being creamed. If I get up there and start preaching... Like, I really want to every Sunday. There's a real hell. There's a real repent of your sins. And, and guess what? Guess what? Oh, man, will I get creamed here. Even beautiful here. Right? Oh, you're you're going to hear me say it. I'm not going to deny the truth, but I've got to ask the Holy Spirit to give me some wisdom to put it all together. But I can't deny This is the whole gospel. Amen? amen. Do you want to hear the truth? What yes. do you want to hear? Fluff the magic dragon. <laughs> Pop the magic dragon. Fluff. And so, circle the word service. Now, Jesus gives us a parable in Mark chapter 12. Remember the parable? He says, 
and, and the, the landowner sent his servants out. Now, what is the greatest social event of your year? Marriage. Did you notice that? Anybody ever go to a magic marriage? In biblical days, it was eight days. So that's why when you read the parable that Jesus tells us, he says there was a marriage, and guess what happened with the marriage? You don't know when he's coming. Why don't you know when he's coming? Can I tell you why? Because you got all these people you invite, and they're going to be with you for eight days. And what do you got to do? Where are they going to sleep? What are we going to eat? Unless you're Italian and tutta, tutta, tutta. <laughs> Drink in bathrooms and bed and everything else. Where are you going to put everybody? So, how many, how many are you going to invite to your wedding? One. <laughs> so, when you read that parable in Matthew 25, that's why it says, you don't know when he's coming, because everything's being prepared. That's why in John chapter 14, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. When you and I go to heaven, you, you plan to go? When you and I go to heaven, how many know it's a prepared place? So you don't have to have your luggage from earth. <laughs> so put out your credit card, masters or visa, whatever you're doing. And you're standing there in line. Hi, my name is Bill. Is my room ready? <laughs> no. When you go to heaven, you got a prepared spot already. It's ready. Amen? Are you ready? Are you excited? I'm not going to sit in heaven's lobby and say, I mean, what else am I going to do? I have no other place to go. The other place is already gone. I don't want to go to the cooker. So I'm, I'm, I'm with the Lord. Amen? So, you got this? So when you go to heaven, the moment you die, you know where you're going. And it's prepared. John chapter 14, verse 1, 2, and 3. Heaven. Her name is heaven, by the way. Hashemayim. So that's is this the fulfillment of Deuteronomy um, 32, 43? Yes, exactly. 40, 42 43. and 43. Exactly. I have with this people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. You've got he will it. You've got take it. Exactly. Take the vengeance of his enemies and the atonement for the land. So this is what's coming to fulfillment. You've got it. Moses gave a vision of the end of time. That's it. Exactly. Moses already had it. Very good. Mm. I'm writing a note to your mother, and you're very good for me. <laughs> she said, De Deuteronomy uh, 32, 43. Exactly. Very good. Um, everybody getting this so far? And then he says, and he was avenged by the blood. Once more, look at verse 3. They said, hallelujah. How many hallelujahs are there? There's four. Why, do we, why does heaven say hallelujah? Can everybody understand now that waits to the end of the Bible to say hallelujah? You understand? Because it means that you don't, you don't suffer anymore. Nothing is wrong. But did you notice we say that in the church every, every day we go to Mass? So what are we saying? Now listen, when you go to Mass, does everybody know this when you go to Mass? You're already in heaven? But you wouldn't know it. Oh, everybody, oh, I'm on way to When you go to Mass, does everybody know you leave earth when the priest says, lift up your hearts? Do you know you left the planet? Do you know you're no longer in Middletown? What should you sing? Heaven, I'm in heaven tonight, tonight. Are you doing that? Okay. So look at the next line with me. Hallelujah! Once more they cry, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. What's that? What just happened in chapter 18? What happened to Babylon? What happens to man's system? What happens to man without God? And so what do they see? If the smoke goes up all over. What image do you get right here? Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 19. So there's a real perishing. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes him should not perish but have everlasting. So that's hallelujah number two. And he, he said, look at verse number four. And 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who is on, uh, seated on the throne. Amen. Hallelujah. Here's hallelujah number three. Now, the circle this year, you notice it's the first one's the angel saying hallelujah. Now it's the redeemed. We join the chorus. Amen. Can you, can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. I, I, I had this great brother in the Lord when I was 13 years in San Antonio and North. When he got excited, he'd go, Hallelujah! 
you know, his name was Charlie, and I, I love that man so, so much. And he died in Europe on a vacation. I said, Charlie, I need you. How dare you die? A man at Chip dropping. And they had to box his body back to the U.S. So he would always say, Hallelujah. I got the message. I got the message, Charlie. But I miss that. Uh, but now, when, when Charlie, I believe, arrived in, in, in glory, the angel said, Charlie, hallelujah. <laughs> so, if you circle there, verse number four, these are the redeemed. So, who do we have there? We have, again, the 24 elders. That, that's, the, that's the apostles and the whole church bowing before God. Who else do we have there? We have the four living creatures, the highest of creation. What are they doing? They're pulling down and worshiping God, who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen. Everybody say, Amen. 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 Now, notice here... You get an amen. And, now, and, a, and a hallelujah. So here comes another hallelujah. This is the third hallelujah. But notice it's pre, it's pre, it's pre uh, figured with an amen. Now I was telling the people again today at Mass, and I want you to know this. The Hebrew word is amenu, and that's the Hebrew word amenu, and it means it means Isaiah seven verse nine. It means an established fact. Now. I want you to remember this. You think you can remember this? Try. Don't try. Do it. When you go to church, and uh, for example, say, the body of Christ, what do you say? Amen. 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 And Hebrew, amen. Here's what you're saying. Uh, when you say amen, you say, I'm going to receive from the mother's milk. Isn't that beautiful? I want you never to forget that. That's, that's the deepest Hebrew there is about this word. So, Amen. Now, when you say amen, and then you say hallelujah, it means it's affirmed. It's affirmed. So why do we put the amen for? Amen is never, never, never to end a prayer. Say you're really hungry, and Father Bill says, let's pray before we eat. And my prayer goes on for 10 minutes. Would you love me? <laughs> you hear your stomach go, girl. <laughs> and how many want, when you're ready to eat, be honest, you're in church, how many want the shortest possible prayer before you eat? Yes. Because uh, when, when I watch guys eating, did you ever watch guys eating? Ladies, watch the guys eating. Their foot goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> I take another guy, Charlie, out. We go to Blimpy. Okay, and that's when I was a blimp. I wanted to eat the Blimpy. And when Charlie started eating his sandwich, he'd go. And then I go like this. Charlie, cool with that leg. What's going? And I only had one vision: a dog going. <laughs> 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 So, here's what you do to your family. When it's dinner time, say, we're going to pray now. Watch their, just watch their face. You've got to get some reaction. You know? <laughs> Amen. So now notice here, it's Amenu Hallelujah. It's an established fact. It's an established Now, why, why do we have the third Hallelujah? Because the church is joining. The bride of Christ. Amen. Is this good? Yeah. Then he says there, Hallelujah. And from the throne came, praise our God, all your servants. Now, who are the servants? <coughs> They're the servants. They are the prophets. Who are the servants? Remember in Revelation chapter 6, these are the people martyred for Jesus. And they're going to get their day. That's why they say, Hallelujah! How, how many of you ever say, you know, don't ever seek vengeance on somebody? Right. Remember the nation was fixed with the OJ trial? Yeah. Did you watch it day yes. after day? Yes. He did it. He did it. In my family they were saying, He did it! He did. I know that glove and everything else. He did it! Okay? And so that, that's what they're saying. I'm not going to judge OJ. That's not my job. I, I told you how to get out of jury duty. I told you that, right? If you ever get jury duty, kick open the door and say, Jesus forgives everybody, and so do I, so goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, they will never get me on a jury. I mean, I'm going to tell them that. I said, I, I can't judge people. That's not my job. <laughs> uh, just, just, and so if you ever bother, just try it. If you want to get out, say, look, Jesus forgives. I, just, and I can't judge anybody. We don't need you. We both agree. And make sure you send my five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so praise our God's circle with servants. I have to get out of here. You want to go? <laughs> just go up there. Say, Excuse just me. Say Bill said. Can I talk to a lawyer right now? Jesus forgives everybody, so do I. We don't need you. Goodbye. We agree. Goodbye. <laughs> Praise our God, all your servants. So servants are the prophets, and you who fear Him um, have reverence of Him. Fear means reverence. Small and great. Everybody, right? Now let's get ready for the fourth hallelujah. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. Here's the church praising. The church is praising. 
like the sound of many waters, right in there, Psalm 29, and like the sound of mighty thunder peals. And how many now, now watch this, when we go to heaven, there's going to be something interesting that's going to happen. This is so good you'll be able to sleep. When you go to heaven, there's going to be a swell of praise. I did it once to a group. And, and I could do it here if you, if you really want to try this little dynamic. Um, you, you could just say, praise God, very slow. And then you say, praise God, louder. You say, praise God, louder. You say, praise God. And then you can see the difference. It swells. Mm. So when you and I go to heaven, Lord willing, through faith in Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? As soon as you step into the portals of glory, that there's going to be a swell of music. How many ever heard the monks going, Alleluia, Alleluia. Now, I like that music, but I like a little more. <laughs> you know? I like, Alleluia. I like a little more bounce to it, you know? And so when you and I go to heaven, that's why there's hallelujah, 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 and hallelujah. Are, are you getting this? Mm -hmm. So now comes the fourth hallelujah, and with the fourth <coughs> hallelujah comes the supper of the Lamb. What do we call that? Our Eucharistic banquet. Then he says there, Then I heard what seemed to be, verse 6, the voice of a great multitude, thunder peals, hallelujah, underlined, there's the fourth one. Now, the Holy Spirit was showing me, why are there four hallelujahs? There's four hallelujahs because it represents the corners of the earth. Now, why four? What, what does this mean? Does anybody know what this means? We already did this. Just review. It's the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. So you're going to hear in the liturgy for the rest of your life, hallelujah. And so what do you say? Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice, exult, and give Him glory. The marriage underline, the marriage of the Lamb. Now, when you receive Jesus in the Eucharist yesterday or today, what do we say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who come to the marriage of the Lamb. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. I love that language. I'm so glad for that wonderful change in the liturgy. That's the original, by the way. So it's not that it's a change. We're just going back to the original way it was. The marriage of the Lamb. So you're going to... How many of you are all married? Mm -hmm. uh, see that interesting <coughs> spouse? Enjoy him for a few more years and that's it. It's over. Okay? Mm -hmm. when, when it's over. See that interesting spouse? You're not going to be married to him in heaven. You're not going to be married to her. Amen? It's over. It's over. What, what, what's gonna, you're going to be married to the Lamb. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? You know, your marriage should represent you being married to the Lamb already, does it? <laughs> Paul says, in anybody married? Ephesians chapter 5. You should be married. Husbands, treat your wives better than your own body. Are you doing a good job? <laughs> Okay? Because your marriage represents the glory of God. Uh, she's saying hallelujah. Okay, very good. Okay. And I, I hope you're all beautifully happily married. So, we, we can see the marriage of the Lamb. Now, marriage is long. I told you in biblical days, it is the social event. But here's the difference of this marriage. If you're invited by the most important person in this country, maybe you might say the president, just humor me and say yes to everything you're going to say for a um, I don't know what your politics are, but I'm not going to answer. Say you're right for the most important, or just to meet the President of the United States. And he'll fly you down, and, and you can have uh, lunch with him. And wouldn't anybody here say, I feel so honored? No. Now, the King of Kings, just amuse me. <laughs> the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is inviting you to his banquet. And it's a wedding because it's the highest human experience of life. It's new life, it's joy, it's wine, it's celebration. It's what we do the best. What do you do? You, you, generally speaking, you wear good clothes. Generally speaking, oh, what I've seen. I, I've seen black widows coming in, like, and they come up, in, and one time it was like, they came up in black, I'm like, oh my heavens. And then I, I went right around here to a, uh, a wedding, uh, I won't tell you where it was, and they came in doing flips in midair. I'm like, oh. That was their entrance. You know, one of the. You're not going to have that ex experience when you go to heaven, okay? It'd be better than that. Because we're all sitting at table number one. Sister Is Isn't your coming to the Lord, isn't your rebirth, your being born again, isn't that the marriage of you and That's Jesus? right. That's my beginning. Now, in order. Now, your consummation, the consummation is when the woman sheds her blood for the first time. 
And we married the virgin Jesus, and his blood was shed on the cross. That's why Jesus said, it is finished, consummation. So your marriage has been consummated at the cross. Are you getting this? Are you getting the beauty that I just shared with you? So we, the bride, are married to the virgin. The blood was shed on the cross. So that's why when you say this little expression, well, Jesus is in me. When you have relations with your spouse, you enter in, don't you? So when you say Jesus is in me, the Holy Spirit enters in through us and we have this living relationship with Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. And it's all through the power of the blood of the Lamb. Next he says there, so underline that, his bride has made herself ready. Now, when you go to, when you go to heaven, you've got to make yourself ready. Anyway, know how, remember how you made yourself ready? Ladies, did you ever get yourself ready? Here's what you do to get ready, ladies. <laughs> They like it. Yeah. <laughs> you look at the mirror, <laughs> and your husband's already. Come on, let's go. <laughs> we right there. Let's get the earrings on. <laughs> Put your bracelet on. You got money? Yeah, I got money. You got your credit card? Okay. Got the envelope? Yeah, got the envelope. And the husband's like, come on. <laughs> you're up there. I'm almost ready. I got to do my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, make sure my fingers are done, all right? Perfume. Right. Okay. And so, I love this image here. The bride's got to get herself ready. So, are you ready? Are you ready? How do you know when you're ready when you tell them to come? Are you all telling them to come? Some of you want them to come when you have like... Would you please come, Lord? Please come right now. Anybody ever say, I want it now. <coughs> so again, that. Now, look at, look at verse number 8. Notice how, notice how she gets herself ready. Look, this is so good. It was, it was granted to her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. Underline that. That's your wedding garment. That's fine. Now, what's interesting about this is the fine linen. How many know when Jesus died on the cross? He wore, John 19... He wore the pure linen. Mm -hmm. Remember the shroud? Remember that they, 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 they did it at the bottom? Remember they were rolling dice, the Atlantic City crowd? Do you remember that? Yeah. Atlantic City is everywhere. I can't get rid of that Atlantic City. And they were rolling dice for him? Mm -hmm. How many know the Bible teaches us he wore a seamless garment? It was the garment of a priest. The Holy Spirit showed me something powerfully. I was preaching Saturday night on Divine Mercy in Spanish. It didn't come out the same way that I was doing it in English. And this particular crucifix had Jesus' hands like this. Mm -hmm. And I said to them in Spanish, I said, look. I said, look at, look at his hands. It's the hands of a priest. If you notice when I bless you, I usually don't like to bless you like this. I usually do this. You know why I do this? Because it's a priest hand. Are you picking up what I'm trying to do for you for the past? Like and so, so, so I bless you like this. So if you watch me, those are, those are my little things. I'm giving you theology, everything I do. There you go. Okay? So, and, uh, so, so notice there, that's your clothes. And, and what is it, how many know you're, when you're baptized, you're priest, prophet, and king? king. king. So you've got to put your clothes on. <coughs> Amen? Amen? That's why when you go to church, and this church is driving me nuts, put your clothes on. <laughs> Do you know every Sunday I say to my mind, put your clothes on. I don't say it out loud, I'm like, okay. Well, this is the way I am, you don't like it, I'm not coming. Put your clothes on. <laughs> put your clothes on. Okay. Okay. I don't want to see ladies your tattoos. <clears throat> Next he says there, what, what are your clothes? Look at verse 8. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, it's not saying we can earn our salvation, but when you allow the Holy Spirit to be alive in you, you do deeds of righteousness, deeds of mercy. Remember the corporate works of mercy? Mm -hmm. That's what you'll be wearing. So what is your clothes going to be made of? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What does Isaiah say? They're called the garments of praise. How many know when you go to heaven? I don't care if you don't sing now. How many know when you go to heaven, you're going to sing and you will like it? <laughs> Because how many hallelujahs have you heard when you got into heaven? Four. What's the fourth hallelujah? 
You're going to your, your wedding. So what's the what's the opening song? Bum 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 bum. Who's gonna pay the bill? No. <laughs> You're not gonna hear bum 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 bum. When you come up that aisle, are you gonna say, There you are standing there loving me? No, no. You're coming up to the four hallelujahs. And the fourth is the wedding of the Lamb. And here you come. You're gonna be crying. It's so beautiful. Heaven. Marriage in heaven. But I had to put up with down on earth. <laughs> now I get the marriage in heaven. How many can't wait? How many of this is good stuff you're getting? This is the marriage in heaven. You're all going to get it. Come on, we got to persevere. Nobody get, give up. I'm a Navy SEAL. Not really, but <laughs> we don't leave our wounded behind. Come on, come on. We're all going to make it, amen? amen? We're all going to the other side, amen? amen. So for the violin of the righteousness of the saints. Now, <coughs> when you say the word saints, in the Bible, saint is never, never singular. Never singular. Yes, sir, we canonized two wonderful holy men. Uh, and Saint... John Paul and Saint John the 23rd. But that's singular. These are the saints. The believers. Saints means believers. Saints mean those. So that's why I call you saints in the making. Alright, I'm trying to encourage you. Then he says, and the angel said to me, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. How many of you all been invited? Are you going? Yes. You gotta send in your RSV. <laughs> Amen? Amen. And the reason why it's taking so long because the preparations are still going on. God's still trying to figure out where he's going to put you. <laughs> he's, going to put, he's going to put you with him. Now, does everybody know when you're going to heaven? Uh, really. Uh, in, in John chapter 14, you call it a mansion, right? When I get my mansion. No, you're not going to a mansion. You know what the Greek word means? What it, it means God's going to give you a room. That's what it means. Now, what is, now when you go to heaven... You're going to be on the Father's, in the Father's mansion. And guess what? We're all going to sit at table number one. And don't get nervous. Well, look, he's closer to Father Bill up there. No, he'll be close to you too. I don't know how he's going to pull this off. He's God, amen. So how many know when you go to heaven, it's one room. God's Italian. <laughs> John 14, how many know it's going to be a room? Are you getting this? And then he says there, so underline there, notice this is one of the last Beatitudes of the Bible. A Beatitude starts with blessed. Good stuff. And then he says there, blessed are they, uh, the supper of land. He said to me, these are the true words of God. Look at verse 10. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. Oh, John does something horrible. <laughs> He starts to worship an angel. Do we worship anyone or anything except God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? We love Our Lady. We love Our Blessed Mother. But we don't worship her. And that book, that, that book, The Heaven is Real, the little boy saw Mary kneeling before. We love our mother. She's the greatest intercessor there is. She's holy. She's the Immaculate Conception, isn't she? We honor her. We highly honor her. And if you have a problem with Mary, here's, here's what you do. You say to Jesus, Lord, I don't understand Mary, but I want to do everything you want. Then you say, Jesus, I want to honor Mary as much as you do. Okay? okay. If you have a problem with Mary, just say, Jesus, I want to honor Mary as much as you do. How many know that's really good? That's all I want to do. I want to honor Mary as much as our, my Lord Jesus does. And I need Mama Mary. Amen? Amen. I need her love. Amen. That flows from the cross. Then I fell down, as, but what did he try to do? He, he worshipped him, and he said to him, You must not do that. So the angel said, Don't do that. Don't worship me. Because the angels look so what? So magnificent. If an angel walked in here, you go, What would you and I be tempted to do for a holy angel? I don't worship. And then he says, I'm a fellow servant with you, and, and your brethren, who behold the testimony of Jesus. What's the testimony of Jesus? He died on the cross. Worship God! Only God alone. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
What's the spirit of prophecy? Christ has died. Christ has risen. We're living in prophetic times. And here's what you and I got to decide right now. Are you following Jesus or not? Because the crowd isn't. I'm not conv convinced the people upstairs are following him. I'm not convinced. You know when I'll be convinced the crowd upstairs is when they start lining up for confession. Not just because it's Easter duty and we get it done with. But praise God through divine mercy what we've been doing this week. Do you know people have returned to God after decades away? Amen. This week. Praise the Lord. There's the hallelujah. But that's the, that's the heaven word. You got it? Now, what, uh, uh, verse number 11. Then I saw heaven open. Now when he saw heaven open before, it was Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. Now he sees heaven open. The last time he saw heaven open, it was the Ark of the Covenant. And then when he saw heaven open, it was the woman came out. Do you remember? I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Everybody underline the horse. Now, a horse in the Bible means what? War. When Jesus came into Jerusalem the first time, what did he come in on? A donkey. A donkey, a donkey means peace. See, Jesus could not ride a horse on, because if Jesus came into <coughs> Jerusalem on a horse, what would they think? Take up your swords. And some of them, were, uh, how many ever heard of a group called the Zealots? And Judas is already conniving to betray. J Judas was the only person born in Jerusalem. That's why he knew the streets. The other, the other eleven were in Galilee. And so, when G if Jesus came in, they would say, "It's war. Let's go after Romans." Everybody was staring at Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Now, what's his name? Jesus says that there is a war going on. This is your spiritual war, and this is what I want you to know when you're when you're fighting. How many of we're all fighting for the rest of our lives? How many know if you have a victory in Christ today, I rejoice with you. But how many know, brothers and sisters, you can't stop fighting? The, the problem with it, you're going to lose, you're going you're gonna to go nuts in your inside if you believe that because God has given a victory into you, that's it and you're done. No. You've got to stay vigilant and get ready to fight for another round. You are not done until you crest, cross the threshold into your brand new white garment, until you're, you have your dance with the Father in Zephaniah 3, 15, 16, and 17. Okay? So you got to keep fighting. you got to keep fighting for your kids. Your kids aren't in the kingdom, some of you tell me. I mean, Jesus, that trumpet sounded now. Would your kids go to heaven tonight? And you know what you would say to me right now? I hope so. Yeah. No, you got some more fighting to do. you got some more praying to do. you got to stay vigilant. If one of your kids come back, we say, Hallelujah! But you know what? We've got, we've got to go a whole lot more. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, that, what happened was Elijah got all excited because he beat 450 prophets by, in the book of Kings, chapter 17, 18, and 19, by the power of God. But he said, well, that's it. And then a mad woman came after. Watch for the mad women. Her name was Jezebel. And then he got all depressed, mess, and stress. I need a stress test. I'm so depressed these women are after me the wrong way. That'll do it to anybody. And then now notice when Jesus comes. He comes, he says, he who is set upon it is called the faithful and true. So what's the name of the jockey? <laughs> Faithful and true. Now, when you have these two things together, this is the very name of God. You have the, the truth. The word truth is emet. Jesus is emet. The reason says in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So he's emet. And this is the truth that men need to hear. Jesus is also called the, 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 uh, the faithful one. Emunah. He is faith. <laughs> so, you can see that, what's the name of our jockey? He's faithful and true. The greatest line that got me through my life, outside the Bible, is what Mother Teresa said. And I thank God for her line. It's not successes that matter. It's whether you wake up and still be faithful. Because I have a whole list of accomplishments, on one hand, which matters nothing to God, and then I have a whole list of failures. Thank you which matters a lot to me. And if I were to weigh it out sometimes and say, my life's a failure. But guess what? No. When you wake up every day and you're still faithful to God, that's what matters. So now Jesus comes for this final episode. Now, this is going to shock you. We've just been all the way through the book of Revelation. How's it going to end? What's Jesus going to do? But he already did it. He said on the cross, it is finished, right? And then he says there, um, and in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Underline that. So, what's going to be your war weapons? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you know what your war weapons are in the name of Jesus. What are your war weapons? It's the power of God. What are your war weapons? 
the sacraments? What are your war weapons? The Word of God. What are your war weapons as a Catholic, the Rosary? What are your war weapons? Are you using your weapons every day? Use your weapons and don't give up. You'll stay faithful to God and, and the glory of God will fall up, uh, fresh upon you. This is a very Catholic understanding. So we've got to find, how many of you are going to find Ephesians chapter 6? I did a series on how to fight for the Lord. His eyes are like a flame of fire. We've already had that in Revelation chapter 1. Remember Jesus, the flame of fire? Okay, why? Because in the Bible, when God appears, how does God appear? In fire. Remember the first time he appeared in fire was uh, the burning bush in Exodus 3. Remember I told you many times, whose voice was that? It's not going to make it in your local synagogue around the corner. <clears throat> whose voice was that? The early church father says it was Jesus' voice. Why do we believe that? Because Jesus is the Word of God speaking, right? So when God speaks, it's always Jesus. Remember on Transfiguration Mountain? He said, listen to him. This is my beloved son, listen to him. Next he says there, and on his head are many diadems, because, what's a diadem? The, the jewels. Because Jesus is the what? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So on his head, we have Paul, <coughs> Jesus is the one. Now, when you go to heaven, you're going to be offered five crowns. Are you getting all five? Uh-huh. And... When Jesus walks in, Revelation 4 and Revelation 4, what do you got to do to your crowns? You got to take them off. Because it's all Him. He is the King of Kings, so we got to take off our crowns before Jesus. Good stuff here. And his eyes are, uh, and he was inscribed, which no one knows but himself, that he has a name. Now, when you went into the Holy of Holies as a high priest, what would be on top of your head in Hebrew? That you would have a word in Hebrew. Oh, yeah. The word would be Kadosh. Kadosh. And then it would be the four letters of God. Remember the four letters of God? Okay. You have Kadosh. So let's put that in Hebrew for you. Kadosh Adonai. So you walked in, and what does it mean? Holy to the Lord. So, why do you think John says here, we don't know what his name is? You know why? We can't pronounce that. And that's why Pope Benedict XVI said about three years ago, stop pronouncing it during liturgy. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed in the Mass you never say that anymore? We don't. Because nobody knows the pronunciation. See, everybody in this room, if somebody misspells your name, you correct them, don't you? Immediately. Right? Somebody mis say your last name, how many, um, how many get on them right away? Right away. You, 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 you react right away, right? When he comes in on that white horse, he's the faithful, he's the Amet and Amunah. He's faithful and he's the truth. Amen? He is the peace, he sees the firmness. Faith means firmness. He comes in, when he walks in, he's been faithful and true to God always. Never, never wavering one moment, our Lord Jesus. And then he comes in, and he comes in with the Kadosh Adonai. And that's a substitute word for that. Holy unto the Lord. So he walks in. We don't know the name because we can't say it. We don't know fully what it means. That's why we need Bible study, amen? amen. Isn't that good stuff? Do you understand this? Yes. And in that name, now why do you think in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you can scare away the enemy? I'm going to give you a quick karate lesson. No extra charge. God forbid. This is a great town. There are great people here. Wonderful Catholic Christians. Some of the best I've ever met. But God forbid. God forbid you ever feel unsafe. God forbid. And you're walking along and you feel someone's ready to come near you. You just say, in the name of Jesus, you need to leave right now. You say, in Jesus' name, get out of here. Your heart might be pounding real fast. If you ever feel threatened, we just heard that reading. Uh, I, I need more time to preach on, on weekdays. Mm -hmm. We have five minutes. Mm -hmm. But if you ever feel threatened, there's a threatening prayer we pray against the enemies when you feel threatened. Acts chapter 4, verse 29. If you ever feel threatened, use that prayer right away. In fact, it's only like a line or so in the Bible. Maybe you can pick one of If you ever feel threatened, your family feels threatened, your job security feels threatened, use that prayer. Use that prayer. And it says, Lord, stretch out your hand. Remember when we read that today? Stretch out your hand. 
Acts chapter 4, verse 29. I, I, I just want to give you some application for your own life. So if you ever feel scared, may God always protect us. Amen? Amen. May the blood of Jesus, the mantle of Mary, angels be May you never, never be attacked. God forbid. Yes. He has a name that no one knows. Right. But when we die, he gives us a name. Revelation 2, 16, 17. Know. Right. So there's a name waiting for us. There's a name waiting for you. Beside Hashemayim, wait to see what your name is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> right. How many of you all got to have you getting a new name? Are you excited about your new name? Now, here's, here's what I believe your new name is going to be. Revelation 2, 16, 17. Your name is going to represent your, your uniqueness to God. With your personalities, your quirks, and everything else. It's going to represent... One day I was at a conference, and uh, the, the teacher, Barbara Schleiman, says, Everybody close your eyes, and what does God call you? And you know, when you close your eyes real quick, you see, like, light and sparks, because the light reflects... I said, all I see is sparks. And then I was preaching that day, I said, I said, my name's Sparky. <laughs> <laughs> so for the next couple of years, I said, hi, Sparky. <laughs> so I, I, so I said, Father Sparky, he's here. Father Sparky. So, right, we're all getting a name. So here's the name. <coughs> and remember, the high priest is entering in to the Holy of Holies. But though she's the word for holy, here's the name of God. And how do you, how do you translate that into English? Y-H-W-H. Okay. Y H W H. And that's what Pope Benedict says. That's right. That's right. You got it. So that's why we don't sing it in church, okay? So, in fact, every time, because I, I studied Hebrew, every time I hear somebody say that, I just go like this. You cannot say that in an Orthodox synagogue. You know, sometimes we will walk in and say, if we're visiting, if we say that, the like, don't say Y H W H in an Orthodox If you ever go to an Orthodox synagogue, don't say it. You're going to drive them nuts like you cursed. No. no. Right. That's right. That's right. Okay, everybody got that? Good stuff? Verse number uh, 13. He clad in a robe dipped in blood. Now, whose blood is that? Jesus. Now, remember, Jesus has blood. By his blood, we are saved. And I, I, I really, my whole life, I've always been saying you're saved by the power of the blood. Leviticus 17.11 says this. There is life in the blood. Isn't it interesting that, <clears throat> how many know when we finally discovered there's life in, blood, in the blood? <gasps> Not till the 1600s. <coughs> and it was already in the Bible. How many ever heard of the circulation? How many have been to a doctor? Anybody get blood work? Why, why do you get blood work? It's your, your history is in your blood, isn't it? How many know the Bible said that way long ago? And how many know we just discovered that in the 1600s? Hello? It was always in the book. See how we weren't reading the Bible? And how many know, you want to get another shock? How many know the Bible always said the world is round? Proverbs 8. How I many if we just read the Bible a little more? Well, we had a problem back then too, but there's no printing press. And the monks would... Remember that commercial years and years ago, my favorite commercial ever? Yeah. Is uh, the monk is doing it in the Xerox commercial. And then all of a sudden... And the monk goes, I love that commercial. Miracle! <laughs> and, uh, remember that commercial? I love that commercial. And so, it, it's, it was always in the sacred scriptures. So Columbus didn't have to worry about going like this and flat off the earth. Because the earth is... Okay? See if we knew the scriptures a little more? Verse number, uh, so I read on that verse 13. And the name which is called the Word of God. So Jesus is right there called the Logos. The Logos. He is the Word, the Logos. So the Word of God. Now, that's why I, I'm begging you, my ministry in life is to encourage you and me to read the Word of God. Verse 14, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen are now the armies. Oh, when the saints come marching in. Now, <coughs> how many ever heard this word? I'm sure you all have. That God's name is Sabaoth. He's called the Lord Sabaoth. That means the Lord of the armies. Sabaoth means the armies. So who's going to come out? Now, here comes Jesus. He's on a horse. What does it mean? War. He's going to ultimately destroy all the enemies. What's the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
That's why Easter is such a phenomenal feast day, because you have no more death. You should be cartwheeling in the park. My death is gone. Death, where is your sting? I'm going to die. You're going to put my box. I, I told you I want the coffin. I want the box. And if I pre-seast you all, I want lots of crying. You hear? Lots of crying. <laughs> and don't put a flat screen TV behind my coffin. I'll come out and knock you out. Right? <laughs> so so I, I, want, I, I, I want the crying. I want the flowers. I, I mean, don't be cheap. <laughs> right? So the armies of heaven are coming. And what, what do they do? They're arrayed in fine linen. Hello? What are they arrayed in fine linen? What's a fine linen? The marriage garment. Can you just see this? Everybody walking out in their marriage garment. Holy, holy. You're all walking out. Can you just see this? Can you see the beauty? Here he comes. He's on a what kind of horse? A white horse. What's his name? The faithful and true. What is his other name? We don't know. We know he's holy to the Lord. The high priest comes out, and all of a sudden he comes out because he's glorified. He's the hallelujah Lord. He's the one that is up oh, and comes out, and this whole array is marching out with him. Can you just see this? Remember that song? When the saints come marching in, you're getting it now. Are you going to be in? Oh, I want to be in that number. Are you in the number? You know, Louis Armstrong, remember? I'll be with Louis down in Louisiana. We're bopping along, you know, you know, in New Orleans. This is better than that. I was, I was in uh, uh, New Orleans. I had the best piece of apple pie I ever had in my entire life in New Orleans. <laughs> and I'd never seen this, and I wish I could see it a million more times. 10,000 Catholics were walking the streets of New Orleans. Yeah. And you know what we were doing? We were evangelizing the whole city. We were spreading out the gospel tracts and the love of God and everything else. And a friend of mine, he's a priest now, he says, you help me become a priest. He had a little tiny paper. His name is Father John Primer. And you know what he'd do? He, he'd go around and he, he had one word in his hand, pray. So he'd run up the car and say, go. <laughs> I said, go get him, John. Go get him, John. And we walked in the streets. And, and we were told in the conference, everybody we met, we had to talk about Jesus. So New Orleans heard all about Jesus with 10,000 people roaming. We get an elevator. Excuse me, y'all. Yeah, y'all. Uh, do you love Jesus? Well, thank y'all. I do. And we're sitting down in the New Orleans hotel and by the Super Bowl. Excuse me. Ron, how y'all doing? Ron, it's fine to meet you. We, we're, we're at this conference about Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Oh, I sure do, y'all. And uh, Well, we've got to ask you a question, y'all. Another question, y'all. So what's that question, y'all? Uh, I'm going to ask you, do you love, has Jesus, is Jesus your personal Lord and Savior? He sure is, y'all. I thank you so much for asking me about that. I said, good, your tip is higher now. Glory be to God now. So I, I've never seen anything like it. So I want you to know we, we swept all the New Orleans. And I said, I didn't want that day to end. It did up here. And uh, so we're coming out on the white horse. And all these people are arrayed. Can't you see this? Everybody walking out in their white garment. And never again to be stained. Hallelujah! Because if you know something is never again going to happen, hallelujah! One day a woman invited me. She said, Father Bill, my husband just died. I'm sorry. He really liked you. I said, oh, that's good. And would you come up uh, to Paramus and do his uh, funeral? And there's like nine priests. Mm -hmm. And so I was preaching a lot of the, the holy juice in me with the power of the Holy Spirit. And she went out and she put up arms by the coffin as the coffin. And I, I'd never seen a funeral like that. Just triumphant. He's with God. Mm -hmm. And she went out and the family's like, Mom, what are you doing, Mom? <laughs> and she's like this, rejoicing. You ever been to a funeral like that? Mm -hmm. Amen. And so you can see here uh, what's going to happen underline that white and pure, following him on the, on the white horses. You know, I discovered a definition of a leader. A leader is when you have someone that's following you. Does that make sense? Very simple, isn't it? If you're a leader, that means someone's following you. Someone's getting instruction from you. So someone likes your witness. And so now, here's all of Jesus' witness. Remember we just heard when, when John was ready to fall down to worship the angel. What's, this is the test. We love the testimony of Jesus. We've got to follow him. Good stuff. So we're behind him. Verse number uh, 15. From his mouth issues the sharp sword. Remember the story of the what? The word? Remember we read that in Revelation chapter 1, verse uh, 
11 to 16, which to smite the nations. Now, this is the end of the world. How's God going to destroy the end of the world? Well, he already, the sin in it. How, how are we going to say those four hallelujahs? He's just going to say one word. You know what Jesus, is this a shock at the end of the book of Revelation? Everything we've been through? You know what Jesus is going to say? Enough! That's it. That's it. So he opens his mouth. But you must say, well, this is anticlimactic. I thought it was going to knock people's lights out and, you know. Well, we, we told you all those signs of the second coming. But now he opens his mouth. There's a two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, 13, and 14. And, and he says there, and he will rule them with an iron rod. And that means something that can't be broken. That means he's going to reign. You can't, you can't break this. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. That Yes, brothers and sisters, there is a real wrath of God out there. You're not going to hear in the church that. Nobody preaches on the wrath of God. Why? It'll upset you too much. But how many know God has a wrath? What's wrath against sin? Is it against a human being? No. That's why I never, 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 never hate a human being. Please don't, may we never hate you. Hate what influences them. If they're a drunk, hate the alcohol, not the person. If they're a drug addict, hate the drugs. If they're a womanizer, no, don't hate the women. <laughs> <laughs> hate, the, hate the lust that's in his heart. Yeah. Okay? So, <laughs> just, just hate the sin. May, may God get us refocused and retuned because we're hearing about divine mercy all these days. And then, so there is a real wrath of God. It's against idols, it's against sin. Verse 16. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name. On his robe. King of kings and Lord of lords. lords. That's, the, that's one of the only places we hear that expression. He's the king of kings, Lord of lords. Let me show you a, a little Hebrewism. Uh, I, I want to finish this chapter. We'll, we'll do it. Okay, I want to show you a Hebrewism. Hebrew doesn't have comparative degrees. Uh, like... Nice, nicer, nicest. They don't have such thing. It doesn't exist. So how do you explain something grandiose? How many know we do that every day at Mass? Holy, holy, holy. When you talk about God, you've got to say something three times. Gadosh, gadosh, gadosh. Holy, 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 santu, santu, santu. in Latin. Remember that. And so how do you say it in Hebrew? You've got to say, uh, this is their expression by saying holy. You've got to say, he's the king. Of angels. That means he's really, really king. Mm -hmm. So that's how they say it in Hebrew. So this is a Hebrew. So we say he's Lord of Lords. And so that's like saying it three times, but they don't have that comparative degree. So we say Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay? <laughs> so that's our Jesus. So if you underline that there. And what's he going to wear in his robe? Now, what's his robe? He's a what? A high what? Priest. That offered sacrifice for us. So he died once and once more. We're going to talk about that hopefully next time. And then we have the beast. Now, remember the unholy trinity. Remember the three, the unholy trinity? The beast, the dragon, yeah. and the false prophet. Then I saw an angel standing in the, in the sun. So when, when an angel stands in the sun, what is he doing with the sun? He's pretty much blocking it out, isn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, and a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in mid heaven. What does mid heaven again mean? Mid-heaven means that everybody here equally can see it. Now, if I stood over there, I'd be a disadvantage to you over here. So why don't we have the little podium here so I could be equally distant to most of you and so you could all see and understand and share the notes. So mid-heaven is that you could all see it equally. So now, now the judgment comes in mid-heaven and he says, come gather for the great supper of God. Now, sadly, is Jesus tells us a parable when the Great Supper comes. The Great Supper is he sends out servants. And what do we do with the servants in Mark 12? We kill them. We kill the prophets. Do you know, does everybody know, is John the Baptist, we showed that to you last week, John the Baptist's father, his name was Zechariah. How many know he was murdered? Mm -hmm. uh, if you read the Gospel of James, did you read that yet? The nine pages? You can read it before you go to bed tonight. Go on, go on, get the Gospel of James. It's only nine pages. And it tells you about Mary's uh, betrothal to Joseph. Really beautiful stuff. And it mentions Zechariah was killed because Herod's army started coming, remember? To kill the infant. And he kind of was blocking them and they would, and they killed Zechariah. 
that's a, a story about that. So we believe Zechariah died because he was announcing that the Messiah would come, that John the Baptist was his herald. And what, what do we do with the heralds that are inviting us to the feast? Jesus told us in the parable of Luke 14. What we do to the heralds announcing to come to the feast, what do we do? We kill them. What do you do when you have told your sons and your grandchildren, go, did you ever do this? Go to church on Sunday. Anybody ever give them that message? Anybody ever give a kid that message? Why don't you go to church on Sunday? You ever do that? Yes. Are they listening to you? Yes. Yeah, but do they want to go? No. Did you help them out? No. Go to church. I don't want to go to church. You go. It's time for church. And they roll in on Easter Sunday with their hair 30 knots and everything else. They don't want to go. Did you help them? Not really. So what, what's going to happen then, brothers and sisters, is there's going to be a slaughter. Because they killed the prophets, the servants. They killed the announcers. I'm only an announcer telling you where he is. I got my soul to save. And how many souls can I save? One. I can only work on this man right here, that his soul gets saved. Amen? By my living my faith, by a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Are you all doing it? I can't save your souls. I can tell you, I can point you out, I can pray with you, I can be with you, I can say, you've got to make the decision to come over the line and say yes to Jesus. Are you all doing that? And then he says there, gather, look, look at, to eat, look at verse number uh, 18. The flesh of kings, the flesh of captains. That's again from what chapter we just did, the 18. The Babylon has fallen, right? What's going to happen to all worldly power? What's going to happen to presidents and kings and, and, and all the corrupt governments of the world? From Venezuela and Cuba and Saudi Arabia and China and uh, some interesting people in North Korea. What's going to happen in South Korea? The, the government is just uh, resigning over this. All the, all the little children have just died in the drink in South Korean waters. So people are resigning. People can't stay in it from church people who aren't going to make a profit. Everything is, 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 is the leadership, if it's not in God, it's going to be corrupt. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now look what happens. The flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of horses, their riders, and the flesh of all men. Does this sound familiar? In Exodus 15, what happened to the riders of the Pharaoh? They, the 600 chariots went in there and the water collapsed on them. Do you know what the Jews believe? That their, when the water came down, their ears popped open. Explode, their ears exploded on their bodies. So powerful was it a crush. Pharaoh was crushed. And allegedly, recently, they just found chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea. Wow. So we have a lot of people saying right now, it's only a story. But how do you have these chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea. And, and there, there, there's new scientific proof. Praise God. Then, this, who's going to both free and slave, both small and great, verse 19. I saw the beast, the unholy trinity, come up. And again, in the first century, who was the beast? It was the Nero. And the kings of the earth. And what are, what are kings doing? Do you know the first world war in the Bible is mentioned with Abraham <coughs> in Genesis 14. After that world war, there was five kings. And who, who walked out after that world, world war? Melchizedek. Melchizedek in Hebrew. And Abraham met him. And what did Melchizedek share for the first time ever in the Bible? Bread and wine. Interesting. Bread and wine. Huh? Melchizedek. And by the way, the correct pr Hebrew pronunciation is Melchizedek. And we say Melchizedek. That's all right. I'll let you slide. And then... Verse 19, I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who sits upon the horse and against his army. We're still warring. And what are we trying to do? What's the war going on right in your midst? I don't want to hear about God. You hear about in your house, right? You hear God's <coughs> name in vain. There's another movie coming out. Do not see this one. And we've got to rise up against it. We're going to sign petitions and do whatever it is. If it hits, God forbid if it hits Hazlitt. I think it's coming out in May. And what it is, it's a movie about Jesus gathering terrible disciples, perverted disciples. To counter this, we've got to stand against this. But here, here it's coming. I, I, I don't, I, it's coming out in May. I, I don't catch the title. So it's about Jesus. But this one, please do not go through. It, it smacks against everything we believe and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the beast was captured 
and who sits upon the horse. Verse 20, the beast was captured and with it the false prophet. Now if you underline there the false prophet, the false prophet is the counter to the Holy Spirit. It's false teachings. It's unbelief. And, the, and the, in the Bible, the greatest sin in the world is unbelief. Now you, you can still believe. You still have a chance to believe, amen? Amen. Like the thief on the cross in Luke 23. But this, this, is, this is the greatest sin there is. And with it, the false prophet in the presence that works signs. And remember, what we're going to see in these days, what's going to convince people not to believe in God, because we're going to see other signs and wonders. We're going to see other power. And we're going to be enamored by that power, and we're going to forget the power of God, the power of Jesus in the Eucharist. The power that God has given us within Holy Church. We're going to see all that. And we're going to say, wait a minute. If this could happen over here, then I need to go over here. I, I, I don't need the church. I don't need Jesus. Because the same thing can happen over here. So the enemy is going to be deceiving. So the false prophet is the deceiver. And we're going to be blinded to that fact that we can't see. And now when Jesus comes... What's going to happen is the false prophet will be once and all blinded. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees. You say you see. You see, brothers and sisters, if we're going to come into this living relationship with Jesus, here's what we've got to say. I can't see, Lord. We've all got to begin to admit, I'm blind. If you want to go and begin your relationship, you've got to start, here I am. This is the real me, Lord. I need a renewal in my life. I need you to lift me up. That's what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. But this, Jesus pointed out to them and said, you want to remain right where you are. Does anybody want to remain right where you are? Let's go deeper into the things of God. And so he's going to work signs and wonders by which he deceived those. There's so much deception going on. There's so much unclarity going on. He received the mark of the beast. Remember the mark of the beast? And the mark of the beast from Revelation chapter 13 is the 666. And remember that the mark of the beast is defiance against God. You see lots of defiance. I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to worship you. So it's defiance. And, and right now, the mark of the beast for us would be to buy into the world system, to buy things away from the living God, to say, yes, I'm, I'm going to agree with you, to be the politically correct people there, there, there are, and say, I'm going to deny my Catholic faith. I'm going to deny the truths that are, and because I want to fit in. The mark of the beast for us would be the fitting in with the rest of the crowd. But you and I have the mark of baptism, don't we? Live up to the grace of your baptism. Because in, in Revelation 7, uh, going back to Ezekiel 9 verse 6, this is what you and I are separated for. And you are holy people. And to be a holy person means you're separated for God. And so this is what John sees. He sees that the mark of the beast, those who worship the image, and so what it means, if you want your livelihood, you and I sometimes have to sacrifice being Catholic, being Christian, being alive in the Spirit. We have to give up, we have to give up what we believe in, in order to fit in. That's our worshiping the image of the beast. That's our kowtowing and worshiping others. One time I was in the UN, I was preaching in the UN, and one lady says, do you want to buy this for the UN? It's for, for this cause and that cause. I got indignant. Maybe I committed a sin. Forgive me, Father. But I said, no, I'm not supporting the UN. You, 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 I, I was very clear. I said, I don't want abortions around this world. And you, I they, they were like, looked at me like, you can move along, priest. Keep moving. Keep moving. And I, I said, I believe in life for people. And so I, I, I will not buy what you're offering right now, even if it is a good-looking piece of chocolate cake for the cause. Or your cause. But I'm going to forego a piece of good-looking chocolate cake, all right? So, brothers and sisters, this is the mark of the beast that's already within our midst. And you are, you've got to stand up for your faith. You've got to be counted as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to be counted as men and women on the fire of the Holy Spirit. And then he says there, and those who worshipped its image, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire. That's a description of hell. And when I read um, the diary of St. Faustina, she describes that also. She describes that very, very much. So there's the description, it's the lake of fire, where I always say to people, either you get fired now with the power of God, 
and the Lord cleansing your heart and your mind with and, and you say fire, how do you say fire in Greek? Remember the Greek word? Uh, Pur. 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 Yeah. Oh yeah, in Hebrew it's esh. Remember in the name of Jesus I told you, and the word of Jesus is Yeshu. And some have the word father. And so we, we need the fire of God, don't we? And that's the Holy Spirit purifying us. You and I still have a lot of purity and sanctification to go. Don't get down on that. You are people who love the Lord Jesus Christ. You are people on fire with God. And God is going to stoke that fire more in our lives because you are going to be used in these days. And I believe God's going to use you to bring your family back to God, to bring this church up a new level in the power of the Holy Spirit. God, God is stirring up the holy stokes in this place to, to get a new fire going of, of his love and life and salvation. Don't you feel it? I do. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about what's going on here. The lake of the fire that burns with brimstone. What does that sound like? That sounds like the sound of the war again. Did you ever hear fire and brimstone? That comes from Genesis chapter 19, the fire and the brimstone. And then he says there, and the rest were slain by the sword of him who sits upon the throne. Now underline verse number 21 as we close. So how's the end of time going to be? Jesus is going to say, enough. It's over. Remember, he died on Calvary's cross. What did he say? It's finished. What's he going to say at the end of time? It's over. It's over. That's it. Is this anticlimactic or what? That's it. <coughs> because he's already conquered everything on the cross. There's nothing more he has to do. He can't die again, Hebrews chapter 9. He's done it all. Jesus has done it all. Do I hear amen? amen. amen. He's done it all for you and me. And so what's he going to say? And they're, they're slain by the sword that came and sits upon the horse, the sword that issues from his mouth, there's the word, and all the bo birds were gorged with their flesh. In other words, those who don't follow me, you have chose your own destiny. And then what do birds do? <laughs> the birds come. If you go along, if you go along the road, if you go along the road, you see the birds working on. And so, notice the image that we get. Notice the image that we get. We get the image of um, what happens for those who don't want to die. It's not a pretty image, is it? Now, literally, the next time we meet, we're going to do the thousand-year reign. I want to share with you what the early church fathers taught on the thousand-year reign. It's very, very exciting about the thousand-year reign. I believe it's also tied with Our Lady of Fatima and the promise that uh, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. I believe uh, Saint John Paul II was trying to send us a a word, and I'll share with what I think he's trying to say. Uh, and then I'll share with you the thousand year reign and what's going to be happening. And then I want to give you a map of all the different views that people have. And this is the greatest passage in the Bible why there's so many denominations today. Because of this passage. 45,000 different groups. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, I just ask you to bless my brothers and sisters. I bless you. I ask you to bless Father Carlos and our pastor. I pray that you give these men good wisdom, Lord, and how to shepherd and lead. Thank you for their great example in our midst, Lord, and bless our deacons and our wonderful staff. And Lord Jesus, unite us together in one heart for the great things that you'd have for us. Bless the kids making their sacraments of confirmation and communion. Bless the, the people with the new stirring of the Word of God in our community. Lord, go before us in the Life and Spirit seminars, and Lord, may this community be strengthened with the witness of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we see uh, hundreds come back to you. May we see people renewed in the Spirit. May there be renewal in our liturgies and desire for more of God. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the Book of Revelation, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that the enemy will be un is under our feet. Thank you for Jesus, the great I am. And we ask this through intercession of Mary Immaculate. Hail Mary. Hail Mary. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go forth and give them heaven. <laughs>